Welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. I'm Jeff Deist, and we'd like to wish all of you a very happy 4th of July weekend. But it's not such a happy weekend in Greece, where the Greek people are set to vote on a referendum, which will determine whether or not they will accept the latest terms of a bailout offer from their European zone creditors. And to discuss this topic, we brought back our old friend Pat Barron, who is not only an economist and a university professor, but also an expert on European geopolitics. So Patrick and I have a great conversation about European integration, which really pits creditor nations like Germany against debtor nations like Greece under the yoke of the Eurozone, and in doing so, intensifies and fans some of the old nationalist flames that European integration was supposed to end. And with the Euro operating more as a political project than any kind of real currency, as Patrick explained, spendthrifts like Greece will find themselves chronically unable to service their debt. And Greece represents, in Patrick's view, an example of Say's law in action and a clear refutation of Keynes's belief that you can create artificial demand via cheap credit and stimulate production. We've seen quite the opposite occur in Greece. And if you think the Greek crisis is far away and that it won't affect us or it can't happen here, I would argue that we should look no further than California with its own public pension crisis and huge debts. So if you're looking for a sober and hard-hitting analysis of what's really at issue in Greece, stay tuned for a great discussion with Patrick Barron. Thanks so much for joining us, and welcome back. It's been a while since we last talked. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Before we get into some of the mechanics of what's happening with this Greek crisis, I want to just dial back for a second and say it's a really fascinating example of the loss of sovereignty that comes with some of these globalist schemes. You know, here we have poor Cyprus holding this referendum over the weekend. Um, and, and on the one hand, he has to balance his desire to, to work out a fix for his debt problem with his European paymasters. But on the other hand, he has a, apparently about 57% of the Greek population who, who recently elected him in a very left-wing government opposed to this same workout. So it puts him in, in a terrible position. Well, I've, uh, I've said all along, getting to the sovereignty issue, I've said for quite a long time that I expect Europe to actually solve its problems before the United States. Um, in the United States, we are a unified country. Everybody says, well, that's great, we're unified, and Europe isn't. However, in the United States, we are all subject to the, Fed, the mighty Federal Reserve. We have no escape from their money printing. But in Europe, the European Union, which is a flawed organization and is completely unnecessary for world peace. In fact, it's anathema to world peace, but that's another issue. But the European Union is made up of sovereign countries. Those countries can leave. They can go their own way. And the fact that they say, well, there's no exit strategy in the, in the European Union treaties, the master's treaty, is completely irrelevant. I have said for a long time that uh, Germany should leave. It's a sovereign country. It has a right to leave. It should leave because it's Germany that is actually being penalized. If you look at this thing objectively, the Greeks have actually been the beneficiaries of, Euro of European socialism. They're sort of, a wealth, they're sort of the welfare queens of Europe. There's other welfare queens, but the Greeks, you know, it really stands out. And who's actually paying the bill? Well, it's the Germans. You know, the Germans, and mainly the Germans. The Germans have a 500 billion euro credit at the European Central Bank. This is phony money that they're probably going to lose, or at least it's going to be devalued to some fraction of what it is now. That means that the Germans daily are producing real vendable goods, and they're shipping them off to these welfare queens, mainly in the southern tier of Europe. So from a sovereignty issue, sure, Greece is a sovereign nation, and Cyprus you know, has a big problem on its hands. But this is all the result of this faulty European Union uh, organization that started out with the best of intentions to preserve world peace by eliminating trade barriers in Europe. That was wonderful. And then it was hijacked early on by the European federalists, let's call them, who said, oh, well, if free trade is good, what, what, uh, and we have open borders for trade and the free trade movement of goods, services, and people, well, let's have a unified nation. 
well, this, this just went too far. And it's just, it's become a socialist organization where supposedly all of Europe, every, every one of Europe is responsible for everybody else's debt. Well, that's, that's just a prescription for failure. Uh, so I think this is, this is the big problem is that the European Union is really just another, um, just, just another further down the line of 150 years of European socialism that started back in the days of uh, Otto von Bismarck. And uh, it's just Greece is another early victim, uh, so to speak. They're a victim in one way, as you say, a loss of sovereignty, but they're also, they've been taking advantage of really the implicit supposed guarantee that Germany, in effect, will pick up the bill for everybody's profligacy. And this just, the Germans are just running out of patience, and rightfully so. They should have run out of patience a long time ago. Well, it's interesting to note that European integration, of which uh, the, the euro and the eurozone are parts, was designed to reduce nationalist tensions between countries like Greece and Germany. But instead, we see that by yoking everyone together under one currency, we've actually intensified those tensions. Well, that's right. There are all these countries that occupy the same kind of landmass that we call Europe. Uh, but the United States, Canada, and Mexico occupy the same landmass that we call North America. But Hopefully, you know, we're not trying to have a federal union of Canada, the United States, and Mexico. I don't see that there's any need for it, and I don't see that there's really any desire for it. Um, the Greeks are not the Germans. The Germans are not the French, and there's nothing. There's really nothing wrong with that. What they really have to embrace, instead of saying, well, we all must be under the same uh, political leadership, they should just embrace free market capitalism. Free market capitalism is the panacea to all this. In fact, there's absolutely nothing that can be gained by any country by joining the European Union that it cannot achieve by simply declaring itself to be a free trade nation. That's all it has to do. Just become a free trade nation like Hong Kong was, like Singapore uh, has been, and just allow goods and services to come and go and allow people to set up businesses you still are a sovereign country. You're still maintaining law and order. You're, you still have control of your individual country's boundaries, but you're open to the world and you are a peace-loving commercial nation. This is, the, this is the path to true peace in Europe, not forcing everybody to adopt to a German model or a French model or an Anglo-Saxon model uh, that, that certain countries aren't going to like. They can all have their own model but they should all trade freely with one another and live in peace. The debt crisis and the insolvency that the Greek government is facing is due to the fact they owe a lot of money to a lot of different creditors, but chief among those creditors is basically the Eurozone itself, this European stability mechanism, which is backed by all 19 Eurozone countries, uh, is their single biggest creditor. And, and that's also the entity from which they seek their current bailout to keep going, running on fumes for a while. You bring up Germany. Where, wh why all the focus on Germany? Why all the hatred directed towards Germany? Is Germany simply the most solvent and biggest lender within this European stability mechanism? Oh, yes. Uh, there's no question that they are. Um, if you, there's a website uh, that you can, if you just uh, Google Target 2, T-A-R-G-E-T, -E and then the numeral two, target two. That will show you all of the countries that are in the European Union. It'll be a chart, and it will show which ones have a debit balance with the European Central Banks and which ones have a credit balance with the European Central Bank. So this is a key thing for the banking, the bank, and it really shows in graphic detail that Germany is supporting all of Europe. Many of the countries are in, have deficit balances. In other words, the, they owe the European Central Bank money. Uh, they have not been settling their, their accounts. Their, their own individual national central banks, such as the Bank of Greece, have not been settling their outflow of, uh, of deposits with real goods or with, with real assets. So they're just so, in effect, the European Central Bank is allowing Greece and other countries to run overdrafts. Germany is running the 500 billion euro credit balance. So Germany is carrying all of Europe, frankly, pretty much all of Europe financial. I think the Luxembourg is, a relative, is uh, 
pretty much an even keel. I think the Netherlands are pretty much an even keel, maybe Finland. But Portugal, Spain, Italy, uh, even France, all the usual suspects are running big deficit balances with the European Central Bank, which means that the European Central Bank is printing money and giving it to these countries. They're buying real vendable goods, and Germany is footing the bill for it. If Germany says that if Germany says they're going to leave, they're going to stop it, they're going to stop doing this, which they should do, then the whole thing has to come to an end because there's nobody else supporting it in any kind of meaningful way. But this is nothing more than to say that at, at some point in a socialist organization, the people who are paying the goods just say they're not going to do it anymore. And Germany and has the right to do this because it's a sovereign country. Here in the United States, if uh, we taxpayers who always wind up pick, uh, footing the bill for all the taxes that the government wastes on all their welfare programs, we would like to not have to do that. But we're tied to this unified state, and we can't get we can't get away from it. Germany can get away from it, and and it would actually be good for all of Europe. See, these countries have to learn to stand on their own. If they had not had the European Monetary Union with the implicit uh, guarantee of their sovereign debt, then they then countries like Greece and Portugal, Spain, Italy would never have gotten themselves into the pickle that they're in. They would have they would have um, uh, had to balance their books a long, long time ago. So, Patrick, the European government, the European Central Bank become insolvent. They become unable to service the interest on the national debt. <clears throat> they've issued. How does that mechanically trickle down to Greek commercial and retail banks so that individual Greeks are unable to obtain euro, unable to access their funds at their own retail banks? Well, I think we're talking about a Zimbabwe situation. I think, you know, where the money just becomes, there is no, there are no euros in Greece. The Greeks are running out of euros. The banks are running out of euros. Physically. Physically. <clears throat> and, um, Really, the only salvation for for Greece, I thought, you know, if I could, you know, tell Cyprus and Verasukas or whatever his name is, uh, what to do, I would tell them the first thing they should do is repeal the, any legal tender laws. Allow the people to conduct their business in any currency they wish. Do not put on capital controls. You're just going to have to let this whole thing work its way out through the free market, but give the people freedom. You know, give them financial freedom and give them economic freedom. Uh, they, they've got to repeal some of these terrible uh, labor laws that they have over there and stop telling people that somehow they are, you know, that they're going to be guaranteed a wage above what the free market will pay. Uh, it's, it's not going to be easy. The, the, as we've seen in Eastern Europe, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the countries that embrace free market capitalism the earliest and really the most uh, vigorously are the ones that recover the quickest. And the ones that say, well, we're going to gradually, you know, get rid of the socialism. Well, that drags on and it just keeps getting worse and worse and it drags on and on and on. Um, so there's no there's no substitute for free market capitalism. And that's what they need. Uh when I read what the, you know what the socialists want to do, they want to have capital controls. They, you know, you can only get 60 euros a day uh, out of your bank if your bank has euros to give you. And now there's there's no money in the country. People can't pay their rents. Rent, uh, you know, the whole economy is going to come to a grinding halt. Well, then you've got to allow the people to use other forms of currency. You've got to you've got to free up trade. You've got to you've got to turn Greece into a into a Singapore and a Hong Kong. And uh, if the Russians want to come and invest, you've got to let the Russians come in and invest. If they want to use rubles, let them use rubles. Uh, the Europe has, has created this horrible monster, and it's all because of socialism. And they've got to allow the poor Greeks to earn a living and start paying their bills. It isn't going to be easy, but the more constraints you put on them, the more constraints the, the Greek government puts on the Greek people, the longer this is going to drag out and the more pain and suffering the Greek people are going to experience. Well, it's shocking, but it's also fascinating. I mean, we are literally on the precipice of a humanitarian crisis in what we think of as a first world nation. I mean, we could see supermarkets that look like Venezuela. I also have read, uh, this is quite a while ago, that um, if you travel to Greece, 
that, uh, you know, hope you don't get sick because apparently the pharmacies do not have drugs because the pharmacies have not been able to pay their bills to the, where, they're, where they're importing drugs. So, I mean, this, this thing is going very deep. People look at Greece and say, oh, the sun still shines. These Greek uh, uh, cities in the Mediterranean are still beautiful and you can still, you know, your dollar goes a long way and everything. Well, that's just the surface. Below the surface are, are people that are in ab- abject poverty and things are getting worse and they're going to have a real, real crisis over there in all kinds of ways. Well, you better hope that that uh, Greek airport has jet fuel on the premises to uh, fuel your plane home. But, uh, you know, you recently wrote this great article for the Free Market Foundation where you talk about the, the unfolding Greek crisis in the context of Say's Law. And, you know, we hear so much from what Hayek called the socialists of all parties about how we need demand side stimulus, whether that's through fiscal measures or whether that's through monetary policy. But you come to the conclusion that we need the opposite. We need we need production stimulus and we need to obey uh, Say's law. So talk about Say's law in the context of what's happening in Greece. Well, Say's law says that it really is the, the extreme, you know, very logical idea that um, you can't consume what you have not produced. And therefore, it is actually production that creates supposed demand. I use the example in my argument of a, a, a farmer who raises corn. Uh, he specializes in corn. If he didn't, for one, for one thing, people have found that specialization leads to greater productivity. So instead of a farmer growing every, having a little plot for everything, he, he needs some corn and, and some beans, and maybe he has a, some pigs and some cattle, he decides he's going to become a corn farmer or he's going to become a cattle farmer, let's say a corn farmer. So he specializes in that. Now, he may have some corn that he consumes for he and his family and maybe to feed some livestock that he keeps around. But mostly he sells the corn to receive money, which is the indirect medium of exchange, so that he can buy other things. So his corn crop, his actual production is his demand. This is what Say's Law is saying, that it is your production with which you command other goods goods from others who are also producing surplus goods because they are specializing in other things. So that saves law. Now, the socialists try to turn this on its head and say, oh, no, we need to, we need to uh, produce demand first. And somehow by creating demand, we will magically entice these goods you know, out of the marketplace. And uh, when you have a sound money environment, this becomes illogical on the face of it. For example, if the king says, well, I'm going to stimulate the demand and the economy in my kingdom by, uh, by living in luxury and buying luxurious goods and, and uh, fielding a, a great army, and I'm going to do it with gold, well, where is he going to get the gold? He's going to tax the people for the gold, or he's going to borrow it. So he, so he pulls this he reduces the people's ability to produce by taking their gold and spends it himself. So the people would recognize right away that in a sound money environment, this is just ridiculous on its face. But in a fiat money environment, Keynes, I think, saw that in a fiat money environment, all this is sort of hidden. He, the government becomes, the, the central bank becomes sort of a counterfeiter of, of money and with the same result in that it's hiding its real theft of what it's doing to spend money to create this demand. But it isn't, but all it's really doing is causing prices to rise and causing dislocations in the structure of production. It doesn't really magically pull resources out of the economy or entice people to do something that they would not ordinarily do. And this is what our, our Federal Reserve has been trying to do now for about 15 years without any success whatsoever by expanding our money supply tremendously with, with the idea that somehow we're going to magically entice the whole economy into greater levels of production. So this is the, this is the, the violation of Say's Law that Keynes, his whole general theory, his, he wrote the entire book, and at the, at the heart of it is his, his attempt to invalidate Say's Law by saying that fiat money production does invalidate Say's Law. It does no such thing. We're seeing the results of this in Greece today. 
Patrick, as we wrap this up, uh, talk about potential exit strategies. Now, in a free market situation, we would see some sort of bankruptcy process uh, whereby Greek creditors would take a haircut and potentially uh, the Greek central bank and the Greek government would sell off assets, et cetera. But what we're going to see is not that kind of process. We're go- what we're going to see is a very political process. So take us through um, how you see this whole thing unfolding. Well, Greece can't pay this, these debts. This is ridiculous. I mean, the European Union uh, has, uh, and the members of the European Monetary Union, the European Union itself, have been funneling money to Greece. It's I, I really... It's hard to say how it will fold out, but frankly, I don't see this as any different than a bank that has foolishly lent money year after year to a failing enterprise. And when the failing enterprise can't pay its interest expense, even then you loan it money to pay its interest expense. You know, in banking, this is becomes this is sort of a corrupt process in banking. Uh, so European Europe has done this just at this at the national level on a gigantic scale, but it is no less corrupt. And in banking, when this happens, you just have to write it off. I mean, you have to write it off and let the chips fall where they may. Europe should not try to collect this debt from Greece. Greece cannot pay it. That's all there is to it. In fact, I think the whole all, the whole debt structure of Europe is unpayable. Now they may try to get some of it paid off. Uh, you know, there may be some, I don't know, some goods that uh, the creditors can take from Greece. Frankly, I don't know what that is, but I think it would cause a lot of animosity if, uh, you know, German firms start hauling away Greek assets and up to Germany, or uh, maybe they'll sell them to the Germans, and maybe that would be a good thing. You sell Greek assets to the Germans, and the Germans run the Greek businesses, but I don't really think it's a problem that Greek businessmen don't know what they're doing. I think it's a problem with the whole structure of the European Union. The Greeks are just the, the canary in the coal mine of this thing. They're the smallest country that is su- is the first one to suffer. So I would I would just say, look, the money is gone. The European Union was a bad idea. We've got to liquidate the European central banks. We've got to the uh, we've got to pr- uh, the countries should allow their the citizens to use whatever currency they want. I would say in an interim measure, if I were the Germans, I would bring back the Deutschmark and I would allow, and I would imagine that if the Germans brought back the Deutschmark, there would be a rush of many countries to become Deutschmark nations. They wouldn't want to stay on the Euro. They would not want to reintroduce their own small national local currency. They would just want to become Deutschmark nations. That would be a good thing. And so I think it's, you know, this would be my ideal and an interim step would be to um, allow Germany, you know, for Germany to go back in the Deutschmark and all of Europe may become a Deutschmark, uh, a Deutschmark uh, continent instead of a Euro continent. But maybe not, you know, but with under freedom, you're not really sure what people would do. Um, but I, I frankly don't see that there's anything that there's any way that th- these debts can be collected. Um the Greek people are just being ground into poverty, and it would just cause more animosity, more real political animosity. Um, it's, a, it's been a bad idea. It's been a bad experiment. you got to end the experiment and move on. Patrick Barron, thanks so much for joining us in another great interview. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great Fourth of July weekend. <laughs>